Okay, in this video I'm going to continue on with my tutorials on quantum statistics. This is number 45 and this is a series of sub-videos on the application of quantum statistics. So of those is number 3 and I'm going to talk about photon or electromagnetic energy density. I'd like to draw my, your attention excuse me, to my website universityphysicstutorials.com So at this stage I'm just applying what I've already derived for quantum statistics. But the more important videos for this one are number 44 where I discussed and derived the Planck distribution, number 43 where I showed you how to move from rectangular to spherical coordinates and we'll be, doing, we'll be using uh, the result from that in this video. And also number 42 I showed you the density of states where we are in an infinite potential well and the, we'll say it went from the wave function had to go we'll say, to zero at the boundaries. So it was not a periodic potential like I did in the previous density of states videos. So that was different. So I'm going to be using the density of states formula I found in that. So let's move on. So in the previous video on the Planck distribution what we found was that the Planck distribution f of epsilon is equal to 1 over e to the beta epsilon minus 1 where we have thermodynamic beta 1 over kt. This was in contrast to the Bose-Einstein distribution function which was for bosons, excuse me, that should be epsilon minus mu, beta minus 1. So the difference here was that for photons the chemical potential is equal to zero. The reason that was, was that we had to minimize the Helmholtz free energy. And the Hel Helmholtz free energy is minimized when mu is equal to zero. I discussed that in video number 44. So what we're going to do is we're going to move on from there and see if we can calculate the total energy in a photon gas or in the electromagnetic energy or the light around us. Now what we need to assume up until now I've been I've been dis describing the occupant this function here as the occupancy function. So the probability that the uh, state is being occupied by a particle. But in this video I'm going to assume that or we'll say think about it as being the number of particles or photons per state because of course bosons you can have as number of, uh, as many particles as you want per state okay and from now on I'm not going to use the word state I'm going to use mode because when we're talking about light photons or electromagnetic energy we need to we talk about modes so if you say there, there are three modes that means that there are three states for the photons to exist in so in the video on the density of states uh, we showed the following we showed that for a photon living in, in, the bo in uh, an infinite potential well, the wavelength depended on the quantum number n in the, in, the, in the manner of twice L over n, where L was the length of the box. We could also say that P is equal to Hn over twice L, and that the energy was equal to uh, Hcn over twice L. I explained that in the video on the density of states. So what we need to do now is we need to work out the total energy due to all the photons in all the different modes. So it should be pretty clear to you that the integral we need to do for that in general, I suppose, the integral in general we need to do where we have conti a continuum of states is the infinite integral of the energy per mode times the number of particles in that mode. And we need to integrate it to E. Okay, so that's in general what we're going for. I'm sure you've seen an integral like that before. So if we apply that to what we have at the moment, we're going to have that the total energy is equal to hc over twice l, and we're also going to have this, this infinite integral, and it's going to be n dn over e to the hc over 2l kt minus 1. Now, to be honest, what I really, what I didn't show there, I just kind of went straight from the, uh, I went straight from the discrete states to the, to assuming that I could do it, use it as an integral. But really, what I should be doing is summing over n sub x, n sub y, and n sub z, because of course n is equal to the square root of n sub x squared plus n sub y squared plus n sub z squared. But I'm assuming that immediately I can go. Uh, and just and you know approximate it as an integral because there are so many states it may as well be a continuum. Now we need to remember here that n is actually a vector. So if we talk about our n space, which I'm sure you've seen in my previous videos, let's say this here is the vector n. 
Well, the vector n can be written, as I said a minute ago, as we'll say uh, n is going to be equal to n sub x in the, let's say, i hat direction for argument's sake, n sub y in the j hat direction, and n sub z in the k hat direction. All right, so in order to integrate this, we're actually integrating across three dimensions. This single n is actually being integrated across three dimensions in n space. So this kind of suggests that we need to move to spherical coordinates because it's just an easier way of doing it. And I showed you how to do that in the previous video. So I'm going to move from rectangular coordinates to spherical coordinates. All right, now what you need to notice is that we, uh, we have this factor of n here. And from the spherical coordinates, it was, it was something like r, uh, r squared sine theta um, d theta d phi dr, something like that for the volume element. But the point is this, that you get this r squared term, or in this case, n squared term. So we're going to have an n squared term multiplied by another n squared term, giving us an n cubed term. Okay, so that's where the, you'll see an n cubed term in a minute, and that's where it comes from. So there is one more thing I need to show you and that we need to assume the photons have two polarizations. Now, I don't want to get bogged down this A-T-I-O-N-S. Okay, so look, if you can accept, for example, that waves can have transverse and longitudinal modes or transverse and longitudinal polarization, we can accept, just accept it for the moment that we can add a uh, factor of two in here for that reason. Similarly, of course, electrons have two spin states. So, with electron density of, state, density of states, we have to uh, add in another factor of two. So anyway, so moving to spherical coordinates, which I showed you how to do in a previous video, of course, for probably the fourth or fifth time I've said that, we're going to have the following integral. We're going to have n cubed hc over l dn over e to the, we'll say, I'm just going to call it beta epsilon because it's just easier to write. Then we're going to have the integral from zero to pi over two of sine theta d theta, d theta like this, and the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of d phi. Now look, this is baby stuff here. If you just do that, you know, for example, that the integral of sine theta is negative cosine theta. You're just going to get pi over 2 is the answer for that. All right, so plugging that in, we're going to have the following. We're going to have uh, actually plugging that in and doing one more thing. It's, it looks nicer if we make a change of variables. The change of variables I'm going to do is going to go to energy space. So we know that n from earlier on is equal to twice L over HC times epsilon. And that dn is equal to del n del epsilon d epsilon or is equal to twice L over HC uh, d epsilon. So what I'm going to do is make that substitution which will result that E of um, we're going to have it's going to be epsilon over KT or equal to E to the beta epsilon even though I know I've kept it like that. But I'm going to go to epsilon the whole way across rather than having n and epsilon. So if you do that and plug in the fact that we have a value here of pi over 2, the, the total energy is going to be equal to the following integral. 8 pi times the volume divided by hc cubed. And then we're going to have this infinite integral of epsilon squared, or excuse me, epsilon cubed d epsilon over e to the beta epsilon minus 1. Now you might be saying to yourself, where did the volume come from? Well, L cubed is equal to the volume. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. So now we're left. This integral gives us the total energy. Now, I'm going to do a small bit of a sleight of hand. Well, it's not really a sleight of hand, I suppose, really. It's just a small bit of clever thinking. Not on my part, by the way, but of Max Planck's. So, uh, Max Planck then said, well, hold up a second. What we really have here is energy density, because we have U over v, if we divide across by v, is going to be equal to uh, it's going to be equal to 8 pi hc to be cubed and we're going to have our infinite integral. Now of course the units on this should be joules per meter cubed. Well, that's what it has on the, on the left hand side anyway. Joules per meter cubed on the left hand side. Well, that of course means that what we have is an energy density. And what we're doing in order to calculate the total energy is integrating the energy density across all space. Okay, so that suggests that we have the following function as our energy density. We have u of epsilon is equal to 8 pi over hc to be cubed epsilon cubed 
over e to the beta epsilon minus 1. This is the energy density. But what are the units on it? It's energy density, joules per meter cubed, but it's also per, uh, per um, uh, energy interval or per photon wavelength because we have this d epsilon term here. So in actual fact, the, en uh, the units in this are per meter cubed. Now this is very important because we see later on we talk about um, energy density per unit frequency interval, per unit wavelength interval, and so on. So in this case, don't just write it as, as per meter cubed. Think about it as the energy density per unit, um, per unit photon energy. This is the energy density per unit photon energy. You must integrate it in order to get the total energy. All right, that is the energy density per unit photon um, photon energy. Now, of course, we're able to scale this from energy space into, we'll say, frequency space or frequency space into wavelength space. Very easily done. So we know, of course, that um, we or, well. How do we do this? Well, we need to do this by using our you know using our normal relationships. So E is equal to h nu, for example. That means that del E uh, del nu times d nu is equal to de, uh, which is going to be equal to h de. Sorry, um, is equal to. Sorry, what am I doing here? One sec there. Let me do that once more time. D de, okay, so that means de is equal to del e del nu d nu is equal to h d nu. Okay, trivial. Fine, it's trivial for this, but in a moment you'll see it's not trivial for wavelengths. Okay, now what we need to understand here is that if we're going subbing this in here and we're subbing everywhere in for, for, for frequency, we also need to remember that this DE here is also going to contribute uh, for frequency because remember DE, D of del epsilon, was um, H D nu. So we need to sub in the fact that we have an extra fa factor of H uh, when we sub, sub in for D nu. So let's just plug it in here. So we're going to get 8 pi, we're going to get hc to be cubed, we're going to get h cubed nu cubed e to the h nu over kt minus 1. Now, because of this de, let's just write in the, the nu d nu, or the, the, the nu factor of de, which is going to be h d nu. So there's actually an additional h factor here, h to the 4. And so just to put it back into energy density, I can, can get rid of this, this, this factor of d nu, like that. So this is the energy density per unit frequency interval. And if you look at it, you can rewrite it as 8 pi h nu cubed over c cubed 1 over e to the h nu over kt minus 1. Okay, let's see if I can just clear, clean this up a small bit. So it's going to be 8 pi h nu cubed over c cubed 1 over e to the h nu over kt minus 1. Okay, so this is the energy density per unit frequency interval. So this time, by that reasoning, it should be joules per meter cubed per second, per frequency interval, so it's per second per frequency interval, but frequency, I suppose it actually is plus one then, isn't that the case? That's the case. Pretty sure of that. But anyway, either way, it's joules, uh, it's f um, energy density per unit frequency interval. Okay, next, we can also go then to wavelength. So we know that C is equal to nu lambda, so nu is equal to C over lambda, d nu is equal to del nu del lambda d lambda, so d nu is equal to minus c over lambda squared d lambda. Okay, now we're just going to take the magnitude of that and plug that in. Okay, note of course that once again the d nu term contributes this extra minus c over lambda squared in the energy density. So if you plug that in, it's pretty straightforward stuff. If you plug that in, you're going to get the energy density per unit wavelength interval is 8 pi hc over lambda to the fifth, we're going to get 1 over e to the hc over lambda kt minus 1. Okay, this is the energy density per unit wavelength interval. 
So this is the energy density per, ener per unit e energy interval, energy density per unit frequency interval, energy density per unit wavelength interval. And this is very important. This terminology is very important. So that's all I've got to say. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel. And you might also click on universityphysicstutorials.com. Actually, just before I finish, by the way, lecture number or tutorial number 46 is a similar one to this, but with more history on it. Okay, thanks.